when the church experiences external issues or external problems or external pressures, it's another thing when it's happening on the inside. And that's the case here in the book of Acts. External problems, yes, but all of a sudden they have an internal problem that revolves around two words. Dishonesty and greed. So they have those character problems as we see them in the life of Ananias and Sapphira. And as we jump over to chapter 6, we find that they also encounter administrative problems. Because the Greeks come, who are also part of the church there in Jerusalem, and they say that our ladies, in other words, some of our widows, some of our poor people, are being neglected in the distribution of food. And as we study that chapter, we understand that that's how the deacons came about it. They appointed some men who were full of the Holy Spirit. And the idea was that they would take care of these matters, hold up the hands of the apostles so they could give themselves to the Word of God and to prayer. Very clear in the passage here in the Word of God. So we have the internal problems of dishonesty and greed and at the same time administrative issues. And as long as we have a church that's made up of human beings, the church is going to have those kinds of problems. That is obvious. That is obvious that we cannot miss. Now, at the same time, in this church in Jerusalem, we have people, for the majority, who are living at a very high level. In fact, I've given you a formula that represents what I'm talking about. For example, FDF stands for Fully Devoted Followers. You have here a large number of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ who, second plus in the formula, are living their life for Jesus Christ at a very high spiritual level. So fully devoted followers of Christ plus devoted followers of Christ who are living at a high spiritual level equals AGI, which is highly effective influencers. Wouldn't you like to be a highly effective influencer for the kingdom of God in your walk with Jesus Christ? That was true of a lot of these people, not just the apostles, but those who were within the congregation of the church of Jerusalem. There are people in the church who have raised the bar very, very high. One of the things that we've all already learned is that in this community, they, they sold possessions and they distributed out of their need bank, they distributed to those that were in need. And in the background of what has happened in this story is one of those highly effective influencers. His name was... Joseph are actually Barnabas, which translates comfort. As you really look at the Greek on this word, on this name, you really can't make it say encouragement. He was really a man of comfort, and because he was such a comforting individual, then people received encouragement from his life. So he became known as the son of encouragement. That's who Barnabas was. And we learn in the background of this passage that Barnabas had sold a piece of property that would meet the needs of some of the people who were in need within the church or within the community. And at the same time, as he's living as a fully devoted follower at a high level of spiritual living, therefore becoming a highly effective influencer, what's he going to do as a, as a highly effective influencer? He's going to affect other people. So he had a profound impact on a lot of people. And there were two people there that were highly affected by Barnabas, and they were Ananias and Sapphira. Now the problem with them was they wanted to claim without sacrifice. And so that leads us to the problem that comes about here in the church with respect to Ananias and Sapphira. We find that they sell a piece of property, which they had the right to do. They didn't have to do it, they chose to do it. And uh, they gave money and laid it at the apostles' feet because they wanted to be what? They wanted to be a repeat of what Barnabas had done. They wanted to get the same claim that he had because he was so highly respected as a highly effective influencer there in the church. But the first thing we learn from Ananias and Sapphira is that they were great contenders. They weren't the real thing. They said that they had given all the money, but they only gave a portion of it. And that's where the problem comes. They pretended to do something that they really didn't do. They gave the impression that they gave the entire amount of money, but the lie was that they lied to God in that in their hearts.
They connive together, the Greek says, in order to keep back a portion of the money and yet make it appear that they gave all. And so they were pretenders. I guess a better way of saying it is they were hypocrites. And so the first thing we learn from Ananias and Sapphira is that great pretenders always think more highly of themselves than they should. In verse number one it says, There was also a man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. Again, seeking a claim without sacrifice. Now, we have a contrast here, not only with the life of Barnabas, but we also have an Old Testament contrast with the life of a man by the name of Achan. God had a law in the Old Testament with his people, and that was when they went into battle and they won a victory, they were not to take spoil from the battle. They weren't to take anything. They were to leave it. But when they fought the battle of Jericho, where God performed that incredible miracle, a man by the name of Achan took spoil from the battle. Later on, they go into battle against an army from Ai, which they should have beaten. There was every reason militarily they should have won that battle, but they lost. And here's the reason why. If God is not in the battle with us, we're not going to win it. That's the bottom line truth. So they went into the battle of Ai thinking that God was with them, but they didn't know about what Achan had done. And so God judged them and they lost the battle. And then Achan was exposed and Achan was what? He was killed because that was, that was, what, he was, that was what he was required of. That's what was required to happen to him as a result of his sin. And so he is the Old Testament contrast with Ananias and Sapphira here in Acts chapter 2. So they sold some property. That wasn't the sin. The sin is what they pretended, that they gave it all when they only gave a portion. The second thing we learn from this passage is that great pretenders have exchanged the truth for a lie. Jesus promised in John before he went away in his death discourse that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. In fact, the Bible speaks of the Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Word speaks of Him as being the Spirit of truth. And so that's why Peter makes it so clear, Ananias and Sapphira, why have you allowed Satan to, to cause you to lie? You haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. But that's what we have to understand. When we lie, we're lying to God. It's God that we're, we're responsible. Achan, when he, went in, when he stole uh, from the spoil of the battle at, uh, at the battle of Jericho, he was sinning against God, not the people, but the people were victims of his sin. That's always the case. Because sin is like a disease and it spreads and it affects everyone that it comes in contact. So in the second portion of our outline here, great pretenders have exchanged the, the truth for a lie. And you know, when you get into the translation of this passage, this problem goes a lot deeper than just a lie. For example, Peter is careful to say, and this is the way it translates, Ananias, it was your land, wasn't it? Why have you allowed Satan to cause you to do this thing, it says in the New King James. The better translation of the New American Standard is, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart with a lie whereby you have done this deed? Now stay with me. The implication here is that the act of deception is much broader than just them lying about how much money they did. The implication here is that there was a deed transaction whereby they sold this land, which there had to be a contract, there had to be a deed, there had to be a sale, all that sort of thing. But I've read some pretty, pretty strong rip scholars who say that the implication here is not only that they lied about how much they gave, but that they were actually, their, their root problem was that Ananias and Sapphira were connivers. They, they were conniving kind of people. This was their business practice, was to be conniving. Because people ask the question, how could God kill somebody so suddenly, so abruptly, over just a white lie, just one lie? How could God do that? It goes a lot deeper. We're dealing with two people who, who, who really didn't know Christ, but they had a terrible flaw in that old sinful nature like we all have. 
Remember, all the ground's level at the foot of the cross. That's why I told you earlier, this message today is for all of us. I'm talking to the pastor of people today, folks. Oh, what a, what a, what, this is calling for inventory like I've never seen in my life. You see, here's what, here's what they say happened. The implication is that in the transaction of the land, Ananias and Sapphira somehow had moved the property line. Where you see in the process, they not only lied about what they gave, they didn't give it all, they kept back a portion for themselves. But before that, they made more money off the deal than they should have because a portion of that deed, because of the moving of the property line, involved something that belonged to somebody else. Now that makes it really serious, doesn't it? So he says, it was your land, wasn't it? Deep down, Ananias knew that, well, if he responded in the truth and let this thing get straightened out, not, not continue to live in the lie, chances are he would have said, Peter, you know the truth of the matter is, that's not all of the money. We, we only gave part of what we made off the property. We've got to tell you something. Not only did we make a lot of money off the property, we made more money than we should have because part of the land we sold didn't belong. That's where we all come into 1 John 1, 9 as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Ananias is about to miss that. And they continue with the lie. Even if they were giving part to the Lord and keeping back the rest for a nest egg, maybe that's possible, but I think it goes even deeper than that. The Greek words here are used another time in the New Testament, and it's when Jesus is awakened in the boat during the storm. You remember that? And they're telling him, Master, wake up, wake up, we're about to drown, we're in a storm. What did Jesus say to them? Why are you fearful of so you in faith? What he was saying was, hey, I'm in the boat with you. When Jesus is with us in the storm, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have anything to worry about. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what I really believe. I, I believe that their need was great. I think somewhere, somehow, as you execute this passage and tie it with this thing about the storm when Jesus was in the boat with the disciples, I think the real issue here, because I kept, I kept having to ask myself, why? What motivated them? There had to be something in the, in the background. I think it's because they had a storm going on in their life. And they moved the property line because moving the property line, they got the money that figured out we can give this much to the church and we can look good and we can have the same acclaim that Barnabas had. But we can take care of this financial storm we've got. And maybe even put back, back a little nest egg here and pick something happens to me, Sat Sapphira. You got some money to live on. Are you with me, church? You see where this is going? Oh, there's so much more here in this story than these. So great contenders have exchanged the truth for a lie. Number three. We learn a third thing in this passage, and that is that great pretenders must take full responsibility for their actions. We're talking about Christians here. Great pretenders must take, must take full responsibility for their actions. In verse number five, as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and he died. It translates the same way when Sapphira is encountered faces the encounter with Peter later on, three hours later. And as you research this passage, you discover that the, that, that the only time this kind of word for someone dying is used in Scripture is when it has to do with somebody dying suddenly at the hand of God. It always has something to do like with aching, where there's some sort of sin, there's some sort of issue. So someone, they die suddenly because there's issue with God here. That's the only time this is used in Scripture. I think if we look at the entire counsel of God, we have to understand something here. We have to understand that as we face sin in our life and the pretension that all of us seem to live under so much of the time, we're all pretending we need to face that. We have to be reminded that God is a God of grace. And that God gives us time to discipline ourselves. And I, I don't know what that timeline looks like, but I know it's different for 
everybody, it may be one, one timeline for me regarding something in my life, but it may be another timeline for you. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not we discipline ourselves. You say, Pastor B, show me that in the passage. Ananias and Sapphira, when you go to Sapphira, three hours later she comes on the scene. Her husband's already dead. And if you look at the wording in the translation of the Greek, Peter gives Sapphira grace. He gives her the opportunity to tell the truth. But what does she do? No, Peter? It's just like my husband said. We sold the property for a million dollars, but we gave a million dollars to the church. When really, they sold the property for a million dollars, and they kept the half a million, and they gave the half a million. So she had the opportunity to tell the truth then. You say, what would have happened? She would have been redeemed. She would have been cleansed. She would have lived on. Yes, she would have lived as a widow. And she would have had a lot on her plate because she would have had a lot of fixing up to do, if you understand what I mean. So we learn here God does give time. God gives us time to discipline ourselves because he's a God of grace. But at the same time, as we study scripture, we discover that God also cuts people off. Let me remind you that that's in the Old Testament too. In Numbers chapter 14, there's a generation of Israelites who have spent 40 years in the wilderness and they have murmured and they have griped and they've complained about everything. Even when God met their needs, because it wasn't on their basis, They grumbled. They mumbled. The Hebrew word is mirabah, which means to complain. They just complain all the time about everything. Finally, in Numbers 14, God said, you need to understand something. These people that are this age and below, they're going to be alive. But all the rest of you, I'm cutting you off. Moses fell in that category. He said, I'm cutting you off, and none of you are going to go in and claim the land of Joshua Except a guy named Caleb. Remember Caleb? Who went in to spy out the land. And he came back not talking about how big the giants were. But he came back talking about how big the grapes were. Remember that? All about attitude. And he says, Caleb gets to go. But here's what he said in Numbers 14. He says, the rest of you, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. He says, the rest of you. So it's not a new thing for God to suddenly de declare that he's going to cut people off. We look at Achan, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a sudden thing here in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. It's not a sudden thing for God to suddenly kill a man and his wife. When you look at 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. You want to talk about early problems in the church. They had brothers taking brothers to court in front of pagan judges, bringing travesty on the name of God because they were suing each other. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, you have, a, you have a young man whose father has remarried. Perhaps he was a widow and he remarried. A widower and remarried later. Obviously, if you, if you, if you apply the text, perhaps he married a bunch of other women. And the sin in the church of Corinth was that he was having sex with his own stepmother. We're talking about the leader. We're talking about the church here. Paul says the problem here is this guy's not repentant. And his instruction to the church of Corinth was give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That was his order. Just turn this person over to God because they're going to be killed. They're going to be cut off. Later on in Corinthians, you had a problem where the people were practicing what I want to call a caste, C-A-S-T-E, communion. The rich people at fellowships and the Gotham Speaks, they were over here. The poor people were over here. They had the haves had, the have-nots had nothing. 
they weren't sharing what they had with these guys, which went against God's plan. When you look at the Old Testament, I'll read through the book of Leviticus. God always had, he had feasts, he had plans, he had a way to take care of everybody. Where nobody should ever leave without, without what they needed. God had no take care of them. But when his people were disobedient, those were wrong. And that's what was happening in Corinth. And the haves were not only not sharing their food over here with the have-nots. They were drinking the, the wine for the Lord's Supper for the communion ahead of time, and they were getting drunk even around the Lord's table. And there's another Greek word here where it says many of those people became sick and they were dying. So God does cut people off. In Scripture, there's a, an explanation in 1 John. There is what the Bible calls a sin of the death. It's not for Christians, it's not for unbelievers, it's for Christians. If we execute Acts 5 properly, we have to understand that Ananias and Sapphira died the sin of the death. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And then once he gets off this thing about how we get our prayers answered, he said, now, here's a conditional thing here. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin that's not leading to death. In other words, you've got a brother, you've got a sister in the Lord in your church and community here, and, and, and you know that they're committing a sin, and you go to them, and what do you do? You speak the truth in love, and they're repentant, they confess, and you say them. That's what he's saying here. But he goes on to say that there is a sin leading to death. And he says, I don't say we should pray for it. Because all unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not leading to death. But he makes it clear that there is a sin to death. And when younger Christians die prematurely, whether they die the sin to death or not, that's not my call, that's not your call. Our responsibility today as we look at this powerful passage in the book of Acts is that we do our own personal inventory and we make sure that we are disciplining ourselves in the Lord and that we are right with God so we don't have to be concerned about that. And just to kind of get it out where we live, my father, my, my birth father, Donald Buster Reeves Sr., passed away when he was 49 years old. My father loved the Lord. He was a cancer patient. He was a World War II veteran. And he asked them to make him the guinea pig on their research. And so he took some medicine they had never given anybody before. And it made his blood clot and it killed him. Because as his blood clot and the big clot escaped to his lungs and hit his heart, it killed him suddenly. He rose up in the hospital bed and just killed over death. Now I don't think my dad, I don't have any reason to believe that my dad died this end of the death. It's not our fault. But all the, the Bible makes it clear that God does cut people off, that great pretenders must take full responsibility for their actions, and we don't make the call. God makes the call. Our responsibility is what? To keep our hearts right with God. To keep our hearts right with God vertically and to keep our relationships right with others horizontally. Unity, passion, joy, pray, unity. That's the high priestly prayer of Jesus, that we might be one with each other as he and the Father are one, that the world might know that he has God come to flesh. Now, number four. We learn from this story that great pretenders fail to take a long look down the road of their funeral. Great pretenders fail to take a long look down the road of their funeral. I have a question for you. Have you ever thought about what your funeral is going to look like? Do you want to think about what your funeral may look like? Now, I have to tell you, we, uh, we had a service here uh, on Thursday. This, this place was just packed. Uh, Danny Knott's, uh, Pastor Danny Knott's father-in-law, the memorial service was coming. And it was an incredible. 
incredible service. And I got to tell you, I'm old enough as a person, and I'm also old enough in the Lord. I really seriously can tell you, I, I get a little homesick at a service like that. Sometimes I want to say, Lord, why not me? But then I have to be reminded, like Paul, I'm still here because God's not through with me. And I want to go on God's terms, but I want to go on the right terms. I want it to be said, I'm a good and faithful servant, well done. I hope you do too. The thing you have to understand about this couple, if you look at verses 9 and 10, is they didn't give a memorial service. In the Jewish culture, when there was a death, there was usually a celebration. When people got married and people died, there was always celebration and mourning. Not, to the, not for those who got married, but for, the, for those that died. I'll make that clear there. A little faux pas there. But there was a period of mourning. Ananias and Sapphira didn't get that. There was no eulogy. The other day at that service, people stood over here at the microphone, uh, men who had worked for this man, Women who had worked for this man for about oh, 25 minutes, they stood at the microphone and spoke of how this man impacted their life in a positive way. Finally, as an older man in his 60s or 70s, he lost a battle with cancer and went to do it for He was a veteran of the armed services. His casket sat right here and he was great for the American flag. from this passage, number one, that the transparent fellowship of the church has never been violated by selfish hypocrisy. You read that? The transparent fellowship of the church has never been violated by selfish hypocrisy. Number two, we learn that it is proper to employ discipline to guard the church's unity, integrity, and purity. Number three, we learn that even non-believers are caused to evaluate their considerations. In other words, if you're here today and you're contemplating becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, this passage says you're probably right now considering what that really involves. Somehow to be able to convey to people that when you join with the body of Christ through Jesus as your Lord and Savior and scriptural baptism, here it is. You are joining a holy fellowship. Didn't say perfect, but you're joining a holy fellowship. We learn from Ananias and Sapphira that true believers cannot achieve a claim without sacrifice. If we want true God-given and man-given a claim, ladies and gentlemen, it has to come out of a pure heart with the proper motivation to serve the Lord. Number 
five, you, you would probably miss this in this passage. But the fifth thing we learn is that a life of one who is a follower of Jesus Christ is a life that must live up with its name. My daughter and I, my daughter in Texas and I were talking about this the other day. When were we first called Christians and who gave us our name? We were first called Christians at Antioch and we were given our name by the outsiders who looked at the church and here's what they said of them. They are like Christ, so we will call them Christians because they are Christ-like. Are we Christ-like today? That's the question. Are we Christ-like? You say, where do you get that? Check this out. The name Ananias means gracious. He didn't know it to his name. And the name Sapphira means beautiful. Nor did she do a turn they hate. And all that is saying to us is Christians, Church of Jesus Christ, please live up to your name. Pastor B, live up to your name. All of us, live up to your name. Sixth thing we learn is it does not pay to lie to God. And the seventh thing we learn is that we should walk carefully and softly before the Lord in this Christian life. I have to tell you, this, this message, this, I'm talking about me, this, this study, this message turned me inside. There, there are so many things I had to do with as I studied this passage. The Lord showed me things about me I haven't seen in a long, long time. In church, every day I repented. Not what we see through them. And I pray that if the same is true with you, We'll see it in you too. Because we need to live up to our The question today is this Are we all saved? If we did a man on the street interview, if we took the time today, it would probably take a couple of hours. And if, uh, if as your pastor, I grab this. Uh, I grabbed this handheld microphone over here that Lauren was using to sing earlier. And I went down this aisle and to the back and over here and down. And I took the time to ask every person in this congregation to give me your testimony of what your life was like before you met Jesus Christ, how you met Jesus Christ. And if you are a truly saved person today, could you give me a testimony? So the first question is this, are we all saved? The second question is, if we are all saved, are we living up to our name? What's the screen for that? Next. Smile, please. Mm -hmm. Sublime. Some stealing. And some acts of kindness here and there. I try to live a good life. Well, let's see how.
My mom goes to church. So baptizes the baby? Take American Express, right? Next! File, please. Whoa! Somebody's been busy! Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Trying to be good enough, maybe some of the things in the video really spoke to you. You see, church is Jesus plus nothing. You can't add anything to Jesus. And that was the big sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Somewhere there, Jesus just wasn't enough in the storm. So they tried to manufacture the answer. In Christ, we have to do that. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord in whom all of our provisions seen. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. He is El Shaddai, Almighty God. He is Lord Sabaoth. He is the Lord of heaven's armies. He'll dispense angels to protect his church as we ask him and to protect your life individually. He knows how to send provision because it's Jesus plus nothing. All of those names of Jesus. So first of all today, if you're not a Christian, you realize today I'm not saved. Like the guy in the video, maybe you were baptized as a child. Maybe you're like the lame woman. My parents went to church, so it's okay for me. Christ has got to be for yourself. You have to receive Jesus yourself. For God so loved the world. Take out the world and put your name. For God so loved Josh. For God so loved Sandy. For God so loved Greg. For God so loved Carol, for God so loved Wanda, for God so loved Sally, for God so loved, for God so loved, for God so loved. Put your name there. So first of all, if you realize today you're not saved, would you just get up out of your seat and come right now? My wife and Jeremy and Lisa will be here at the front to pray with you, to talk with you. Would you just come? As Mrs. Joy is playing beautifully in the background, we wait upon you. Pray, Father, in Jesus' name, you know the needs today. You know people who need Christ, who need to be saved. Lord, right now, your Holy Spirit is just touching them and wooing them and drawing them to yourself. And Lord, we pray in Jesus' name they would come to Christ today. That they would see that this is their opportunity, that this is their day. That all they need is Jesus. And then I also want to pray for those of you who have believers who want to come and just say, Pastor, please pray for me. I've had to do that inventory like you went through this week. If this was tough on you, they imagine what it was like for me studying all week and praying on this all week. You said, that is in prayer. I want, to, I want to live up to the name. Come and let us pray for you. Maybe you love the Lord and you're saved. You've been baptized biblically by mercy. You want to join yourself with this church family and be a part of what God's doing here. We receive you gladly. So I'll, I'll pray for you as well. So after I pray this time, I want us to all stand. Whatever your need, whatever your decision, to step out and come. Father, in Jesus' name, we need to say so little today because you've said so much through this passage and even through the video. 
So Lord, in Jesus' name, may we all be saved here today. And may we who are saved, Lord, may we be committed as never before to live up to our name. In Jesus' name. As we stand together, church, we wait. As you come with God bless you. churches who meet on our campus, uh, say we know all family mission and uh, also our Baptista Ecclesia, Baptista Ecclesia. And uh, God early on formed a great uh, fellowship and partnership with Sandy and Young and Juan Choi and I. And so for the past, really almost the past year, we've been praying together about the announcement that Pastor Choi wants to make today because they want to be a part of our fellowship and join us. They have brought so much to the table with the music. Had the music been wonderful? And uh, so uh, I'm going to address you. He's going to introduce each one. The, his people are all, they're all Baptists, they're saved, baptized. The church, Salem Gall, is a, has been a part of our association. And uh, these sort of, I got an article this past week. This is happening all over our country right now, where churches are coming together to be stronger and to be able to bring the kingdom. So, Pastor, we love you. And uh, uh, Juan, if, uh, could you come down and stand with Pastor? We'd love you to play, but we'd like for you to come down here and stand with him. All right? We love you. We love you. Yeah, we love you. So, uh, Pastor, you share, share with us and introduce your people, and we'll just take them and go one by one, okay? All right. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to glorify the Lord for giving us this opportunity to merge this church and thank you for 
accepting us as your members. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if you know, last year, the first week of March, Pastor Riggs introduced the Cylinder Family Mission to youth and saying, this is the sixth anniversary of family, single family mission. So, and our, our children play the, uh, the, the creation.